Our next speaker is Harriet Sachs. And uh, Harriet's going to be speaking to us about same-sex issues in family and estates law. Harriet was called to the bar in 1976 and works with the uh, firm of Dixon, Sachs, Appel, and Beeman. She was the co-founder of the Toronto Community Law Program and has been affiliated with the Pro-Choice Defense Fund, Jesse Center for Teenagers, Constant Hamilton Co-op, the Leaf Foundation, and the Advocate Society. Harriet? Thank you. Um, I'm going to start, like the other speakers did, with uh, saying that I have half an hour to address you, which effectively precludes the possibility of my going through the uh, paper which um, you have. But what I would like to do on the theory that you're like me, you come to these programs, you get a bundle of materials, and you never look at them again unless something comes, you come across something in your practice which alerts you to the fact that maybe I went to a program where this was dealt with to some extent. So I am going to go through just briefly the index to my paper and highlight for you the issues that I do address in the paper and then move on to discuss one of the other issues which I think would come under the rubric of litigation strategy when it comes to litigating in the area of same-sex relationships. Um, I do talk about in the paper marriage and same-sex relationships and that has already been touched upon by Peter Jervis um, and the chief case in that area is the Leyland case and the reasoning in the debate is articulated in that case. The only thing I would add is that as Peter has pointed out, the um, prescription against same-sex couples being able to marry is a common law one. It is not a statutory one. Um, and there is Supreme Court of Canada dicta that talks about the necessity for evolving the common law in accordance with charter principles. And so I would suggest to you that if you end up litigating around that area, it's worth looking at that dicta. You will see it in dolphin delivery and other cases like that. Um, I deal with divorce and homosexuality, mostly to point to how the Divorce Act has changed and how in the 1968 Divorce Act, homosexuality was listed among other grounds in terms of sexual deviancy, and how with the 1985 Divorce Act, that has been removed. I deal with AIDS as a same-sex issue in family law, and that has arisen primarily in two contexts. One, in the context of custody and access litigation, and I talk about the cases and the reasoning that gets applied in those cases, and also um, a recent phenomenon which has been observed by us family law practitioners, which is a joining of claims um, based upon the spouse of a primarily gay, uh, gay partner um, having been exposed to um, AIDS as a result of sexual activity within the marriage which was undisclosed during the course of the marriage. And the Ginsburg case is a case where the viability of that cause of action is discussed, and I take you through the Ginsburg case. That cause of action, we are finding, is now being joined with more traditional family law claims, so that what we are seeing is in conjunction with applications for divorce, uh, applications for support, custody, and access, uh, there are also claims for damages based upon the fact that uh, the uh, woman's husband has, during the course of the relationship and unbeknownst to her, engaged in um, homosexual activity and has thereby exposed her to the risk of AIDS. And the causes of action which that revolves around are, arise out of the breach of fiduciary duty and um, assault. And that is canvassed in Ginsburg. It has not been determined yet, but in effect, Ginsburg was an application to strike out an application brought on that basis, on the basis that it disclosed no cause of action, and Rosenberg J. held that no, those causes of action were viable and he was not going to strike it out at initial stage. Um, I then, and do this, I have to say, I concentrated in the paper on custody and access issues for the gay and lesbian parent. I did this for two reasons. One, that this is where, and I will indicate this later, for us as family law litigators, 
um, we most confront uh, the issues around gay and lesbian, I mean, around same-sex relationships, that it is primarily enacting for uh, gay or lesbian parents in the context of custody and access that we, we deal with the uh, discrimination that exists in the courts. And also because Bruce Ryder um, has done an enormous amount of work around um, same-sex relationships in family law. And uh, he did this for the Ontario Law Reform Commission, and he also did it in a paper which was published by the Law Society in part of the special lectures in November of 1993. And he covered a lot of the areas which are covered in my paper, um, but did not deal at all with the issue of custody and access. So I thought it would be helpful to those people who are dealing with same-sex issues in the context of family law to have the custody and access issues put before you. And I've fully canvassed the case law as it currently exists in the context of custody and access tried to in terms of both published, unreported and reported cases. Um, I deal briefly with the issue of adoption. This was a major issue with respect to the new bill and point out that where it is that uh, same sex, uh, gay and lesbian, uh, gays and lesbians are discriminated currently in the adoption law and it's chiefly around the fact that they cannot adopt as a couple. Um, I then go on and talk about support. Um, and uh, talk about the, uh, one the one reported case in this area, which is M versus H. It has not yet been determined, but there is a charter challenge being made to the section of the Family Law Act uh, providing f uh, where, in effect, um, a, a, a lesbian, a, um, in a, a woman is making a claim against her partner in, as a result of a lesbian relationship for support and uh, she is alleging that the, uh, that the section of the Family Law Act which pre precludes um, same-sex partners from making claims for support is unconstitutional. That has not yet been determined, it is pending before the courts. There has been a preliminary motion but it doesn't tell us much about the courts thinking on that issue. Um, I then talk about property and uh, property rights for same-sex couples and canvass the cases on constructive trust because that is the chief vehicle that is used in property rights litigation when it comes to same-sex relationships. I touch briefly upon dependents' claim for damages and mostly note the fact that those claims are not available to same-sex partners and then go on and discuss the various options for reform and one of which we saw um, in sh articulated in, in the latest bill which was defeated in the Ontario legislature. Um, having said that, I um, want to point out that in one sense it's easy to talk about same-sex relationships in the context of family and estates law because currently the statutory scheme offers no real rights to same-sex spouses. They have no right to marry, there is no statutory right to property sharing, either on death or on separation. There is no right to possession of the matrimonial home in the way that a married couple has. Common law couples, heterosexual couples, do not have a right to possession, but common law heterosexual couples have the option to marry, which same-sex couples do not. Um, there is no right to support currently, either on death or on separation. There is no right to claim damages in the event a same-sex partner is injured or killed. And um, same-sex couples who choose to define their relationship by way of a domestic contract do so within a statutory void. The definition of domestic contract, and I do talk about this in my paper as well, within the meaning of Family Law Act is clearly restricted to contracts entered into between a man and a woman. There is no right to adopt, as I've already pointed out. I mean, there is a right to adopt, but not as a couple. There is the right to apply for custody, obviously, of your child and for access to that child. And there is the obligation to support children to whom one has demonstrated a settled intention to act as a parent. We, as has already been remarked, have recently seen an effort to change the status of same-sex relationships in family and estates law and in much broader areas fail. And 
in my view, the lesson has been instructive. It's, in my view, been instructive about what lies at the root of society's ultimately homophobic resistance to according same-sex relationships, rights, and obligations. What I saw happening in the context of this debate was a fear that to recognize these relationships and to, was, and to recognize the fact that they really could constitute families and that they were families which society w would be to accept these families as legitimate families. Apparently, according to our legislatures, le legislators, Ontario is not ready to do this. And for me, the question is why? And to answer this question, and I think it's important that we as litigators do this because these, it will be my thesis, are the questions that we confront in the context of litigation around this issue. We have to attempt to understand the nature of the discrimination in general, and more particularly the reasons behind society's discriminatory response to gays and lesbians in particular. In my opinion, we as litigators and as lawyers who now will be called upon to resume the fight for these issues in the courts, it's not simply an academic question which we can leave to the sociologists and the other social science experts. It's my position that one cannot win a case rooted in an argument under Section 15 or under Ontario Human Rights Code discrimination uh, case law unless one takes on directly the factors which cause the discrimination and addressed the arguments one by one through expert witnesses. It is my position that if one attempts to look at the bases which are put forward to justify discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in family and estates law, one discovers that they are grounded in what are essentially myths. Myths about the nature the current nature of the family in our society, and myths about gays and lesbians. In any legal case involving same-sex rights, these myths must be confronted and dismantled. Ultimately, in my view, the legal arguments in support of continued discrimination against gays and lesbians are just window dressing for the perpetuation of these myths. Sharon Cohen, who assisted me in the preparation of this paper and who is a partner of mine, and I attempt in our paper to discuss and confront these myths extensively, particularly in the context of custody and access legislation. I've touched upon one of the reasons why we did this and why we concentrated upon this area. But the other reason is that in my opinion, when it comes to legitimizing same-sex relationships, we believe that at the root of society and the courts as an extension of the establishment's institutions, resistance lies an unwillingness to see gays or lesbians as appropriate people to raise our children. If we understand why that unwillingness exists and attack the myths upon which it is based, in my opinion, we will go a long way to confronting the problem head on as litigators. Reading the case law and the kind of expert assessment reports which are prepared inevitably in any custody and access dispute is very instructive. The same themes emerge again and again when one of the parents is gay or lesbian. The same questions get asked, and the same misconceptions and assumptions abound. And those misconceptions and questions are summarized on page 11 of the paper that Sharon and I prepared. And if I could just refer you to page 11 of that paper. At the top of the paper, we articulate the questions that seem to concern the decision makers in these kinds of dispute. The first one is, will the child grow up to be homosexual? Secondly, 
will the child's gender identity or gender role be affected if the child is brought up by a gay or lesbian parent? Thirdly, will the child be subject to proselytizing, in other words, attempts to convert him or her to a particular sexual orientation, or worse, be sexually molested? And this appears to be a major concern when it comes to gay parents. Fourthly, will the parent-child relationship be harmed by the disclosure of the parent's homosexuality? And fifthly, and most difficult, will the child suffer from society's stigmatization of homosexuality. In our paper, we go on to deal with each one of these questions and the assumptions and misconceptions that underlie these, the asking of these questions. We go on to explore the social science literature which exists and has been done to address these questions in attempt to show how the research done indicates that the fears the questions are a symptom of are illegitimate and founded in myth rather than reality. And essentially, it's our position that this kind of exercise has to be performed when you are conducting litigation involving same-sex issues. You must put forward before the courts this research and while there, it is still emerging, and while there is still lots more to be done, there has been a significant amount done. And I think that one of the things that we fail to realize as litigators and as people who operate in the human rights field and litigate in the human rights field is just how insulated we are from the kinds of questions that most or many ordinary Canadians have, and many of our decision makers and assessors have. They start from very homophobic biases, many of them, and they have concerns which you would have thought were laid to rest a long time ago. They have not been. You have to go back to square one. You have to show them the literature and call the experts. The last of the questions which gets asked most frequently in custody and access litigation. The one, will the child suffer from society's stigmatization of homosexuality, is perhaps the most problematic. It is the one that gets asked even by those assessors and judges who see themselves as being free from homophobia. It is the one that leads our decision makers and our legislatures, legislators to say, even if we believe the gays, gay and lesbian family units are fine for our children, we must, for the sake of our children, not legitimize these units because society as a whole is not like us. Society is homophobic. The reality is that the child of a gay or lesbian parent may well be stigmatized, thereby making that child's life more difficult. So in the end, discrimination gets justified on the basis of discrimination. And in the end, in my experience, this is what happens in many of the legal cases which are brought challenging the laws which discriminate against gays and lesbians. Certainly, in the one case, one other area of law where I litigated um, same-sex issue, which was the Douglas case involving a challenge to the military's exclusionary policy when it came to gays and lesbians, the thrust of the Canadian government's rationale, which ultimately they yielded on, and certainly we've seen it in the American context where the American military establishment's argument when it came to justifying the restriction um, was essentially that um, cohesion, morale, and unquestioning obedience to the chain of command are crucial to an effective fighting force. That the members of the armed forces ultimately will not accept gays and lesbians and therefore, if you force 
the inclusion of gays and lesbians, you will lead to the breakdown of cohesion, morale, and the chain, and the, and the chain of command. It's true that it may well be that members of the armed forces are homophobic. And it is true that it may well be that much of society is homophobic. Just as much of society is racist and sexist. The question becomes what our legal institutions, including our courts, do about it. And in the custody and access context, do we remove children from their gay or lesbian parents' custody or deprive them of access to that parent? Or do we acknowledge that children can be helped to overcome the prejudice they encounter just as children of other minority groups learn to cope with, accept, and take pride in their own situations. In this regard, I would like to refer you to page 21 of my paper, where I make reference to a decision of the New Jersey Appellate Court. In that case, that case concerned a lesbian mother who was fighting for custody of her children. She lived in a small community. The trial judge, because of what he perceived to be the homophobia and the stigmatization that the child would experience living in that community if the child was brought up by a lesbian mother, deprived the mother of custody. And in dealing with the trial judge's decision, the New Jersey Appellate Court had this to say, and I would like to read the quote to you, which appears at page 21. It is just as reasonable to expect that they, this being the children, will emerge better equipped to search out their own standards of right and wrong, better able to perceive that the majority is not always correct in its moral judgments, and better able to understand the importance of conforming their beliefs to the requirements of reason and tested knowledge, not the constraints of currently popular sentiment or prejudice. Taking the children from the defendant can be done only at the cost of sacrificing those very qualities they will find most sustaining in meeting the challenge inevitably ahead. Instead of forbearance and feelings of protectiveness, it will foster in them a sense of shame for their mother. Instead of courage and the precept that people of integrity do not shrink from bigots, it counsels the easy option of shirking difficult problems and following the course of experience. We do not forsake those to whom we are indebted for love and nurture merely because they are held in low esteem by others. And as I point out in my paper, the same court goes on to note that awarding custody to the heterosexual parent, in this case the father was heterosexual, does not shield children from the impact of having a parent with a same-sex orientation. In effect, they must still come to terms with the discomfiture they will be made to feel by society because their mother is a lesbian or their father is gay. All you do by removing them from the custody of their, that parent is to reinforce in that child's mind that society is right, that there is something wrong with their homosexual parent, something which renders him or her unfit to parent on a full-time basis. I then go on to point to the words of Chief Justice Berger of the United States Supreme Court, and these were articulated in the context of a case where a child had been removed um, from the custody of her mother because her mother had uh, remarried a man who was black so that she was, that in effect she was going to be brought up in an, in an interracial family. And the uh, trial judge at the, at the lower court the uh, decision had been made because of the fear about the stigmatization that a child would experience being brought up in that context. And Chief Justice Berger, in overturning the lower court's decision, said, private biases may be outside the reach of the law, but the law cannot directly or indirectly give them effect. And articulated in the context of our charter, this would take the form of a rule with a discriminatory purpose cannot be justified under Section 1. And Madam Justice Greer articulates this in her dissent in Leyland at the divisional court level. 
In my opinion, the same myths that underlie the discriminatory treatment that gays and lesbians receive in the custody and access context permeate society and the court's reaction to any issue involving the legitimization and acceptance of gays and lesbians. People believe that sexual orientation is a matter of choice and that you can choose to do otherwise and you're being perverse in choosing to be gay or lesbian. People are afraid that homosexuality is somehow catching. People believe that gay men molest small children. And as litigators litigating in this area, we cannot forget this reality, absurd as it may seem to us. Each case must take on these myths through expert evidence and show how misguided they are. Without that evidence being before the courts, we as litigators have not dealt with the roots of the problem we face, which is discrimination. And discrimination is a problem which arises because of preconceptions people have about other people merely because they are a member of a particular group. We have to confront those preconceptions and we have to deal with them. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Our next speaker is Susan Ursel. Uh, she's going to be speaking to us about employment, pension, and benefits. Uh, Susan practices with the firm of Cornish Advocates and was called to the bar in 1986. She has successfully represented an employee with AIDS in the first AIDS-related employment complaint heard by the Ontario Human Rights Board of Inquiry. Also, she has acted as a spokesperson and lobbyist for the Campaign for Equal Families, and written on human rights, employment equity, and various labor issues. Susan? Hello. As I look around the room, I notice that half the people I lobby with are here, so I hope you will bear with me. I know you've heard it all before. And as I listen to Harriet's uh, words about what has to be proven in family law cases, I'm reminded of how I spent the last four weeks in various MPP's offices trying to get them to understand those very same things. Those kinds of proof are not limited to courts. They are being uh, demanded of, uh, of, of the gay and lesbian community by our legislatures, legislators uh, daily as they try and grapple with this issue. So lest you think that uh, the arguments are limited to the more formal area of the courtroom, they are not. Um, I heard Judith Keene's remarks that I was going to do an overview of the case law in employment, and I hate to disappoint you all, but I'm actually going to take you on a much more technical journey through the statute law that governs these, uh, <laughs> nice try, Judith. <laughs> That, that governs the provision of benefits in employment in Ontario. And the reason I'm going to do that is um, partly because I anticipated, and I think I was right in reviewing the papers, that my colleagues in this seminar would have covered those areas, and you might be bored to tears with listening to the shopping lists of, well, they have a joint bank account, they own the house together, they have a car together, they have a cottage together, they've made joint wills, and so on. The shopping lists that are demanded of gay and lesbian employees when they attempt to prove spousal or relationship status in order to qualify for benefits but also because I think it's important to understand in light of the failure of Bill 167 what exactly it is that we're up against, how many different levels, how many different intersecting pieces of legislation we are now called upon to litigate in the courts um, because they have a discriminatory impact upon gay and lesbian citizens. So with, with that caveat, and sorry, Judith, uh, next time I'll do the overview of the law. Let me, let me uh, take you through some preliminary uh, thoughts on employment law and uh, then delve into the thicket of legislation. The first thing you should note is that, uh, as, as you probably learned in law school a long time ago, 
at least since 1986 when I was called to the bar, there is a general prohibition against consideration of issues of sexual orientation in employment. That's in Section 5.1 of the Human Rights Code. In an employment context, some collective agreements also prohibit that kind of discrimination. And um, for those of you who are arbitrators, you will also be familiar with those kinds of provisions. And some of the litigation that's gone on around them, notably the Mossop case, which went all the way to the Supreme Court, where for want of a charter argument, the war was lost or the battle was lost. Um, in that case, which was a challenge to a denial of bereavement leave, the ground was not marital status, was not spousal status, was not relationship in that sense, but it was a challenge on the basis of family status. And the court found that when the concept of family status had been introduced into the Canadian Human Rights Act in the early 1980s, it did not encompass the concept of homosexual families. And so it failed. Uh, it failed even as the court was uh, grinding its teeth, tearing its hair out, and asking for a charter argument which was not made. The junctures at which sexual orientation nevertheless become factors in the employment relationship occur with the introduction of the family into the workplace for conferral of certain benefits such as bereavement leaves, extended health care, other related benefits, and pensions, particularly survivor benefits. The circumscription of definitions of family and relatedness on the basis of sexual orientation has been inherent in virtually all definitions of the categories of those who will receive such benefits by virtue of their relationship to an employee. Sexual orientation becomes a proxy for restriction of the benefits despite an apparent analogy or similarity to the relationships which are within the range that will have benefits conferred on them. If that thicket of language was a little too complex, let's put it this way. We look lots like heterosexual families. We act a lot like heterosexual families. We believe that we have families for the same reasons that most heterosexual people do, but we don't receive the same benefits that heterosexual families do. And it's an interesting concept that is used to, to bolster the conferral of benefits on a familial basis. The concept is that the family is the building block of society and therefore ought to be supported and that employment benefits are a way of conferring that support on a family unit. That is um, a way of exercising social policy through the employment context. But the range of relationships that will receive benefits include heterosexual marriages and common law relationships whether or not there are children involved, whether or not there's a question of actual dependency of one or more members on, an, or on another, and single head families with children, whether or not they're originally based on an existing heterosexual marriage or common law union. The commonality between those relationships which will traditionally be within the range of those receiving benefits is the existence of the possibility of heterosexual activity leading to the possibility of procreation. You don't have to have either of those things going on in order to be considered a heterosexual family. There does not have to be actual activity, there does not have to be actual procreation, there does not have to be actual offspring, there does not have to be actual dependency. Nevertheless, when gay and lesbian couples are called upon to demonstrate their analogous status to that kind of family, they are required to show those very things. It is not good enough for them to say, we consider ourselves family. We support each other emotionally and psychologically. We actually have an equal division of financial support. We actually have an equal division of responsibilities. We don't really depend on each other in that traditional way. We um, have developed a different way of existing together. Nevertheless, we would describe ourselves as family. That's not sufficient. If you look at the case law, what you'll find is there's an inquiry into the levels of dependency, whether there are children, which does actually occur, and so on. To be provocative, we could, we could view the conferral of benefits on heterosexual families as not a bolster to the family union, but an apparent reward for apparent participation in the majoritarian sexuality of the culture, a reward for being straight to a greater or lesser extent, and a reward for opting into a particular relationship structure, whether or not the participants actually really truly conform in their lives to that structure. And that was the fact that that occurs was illustrated to me when I appeared on Canada AM, and after I got off 
the stage, and we were walking out. One of the cameramen accosted Marion Boyd and myself and said, well, all right, what's to stop us? What's to stop me and my male roommate from claiming we're homosexual partners and getting family benefits? And the answer is, of course, nothing except the stigma that attaches and a probably two or three year battle, legal battle with your employer to get them. But the same question, when flipped around, illustrates just how fragile the concept is of conferring benefits on this family unit, because there is nothing to stop opposite sex unmarried couples who live in an apartment or a house from claiming to be common law spouses and receiving those same benefits, except that society puts some level of trust in them that they won't be lying about that kind of thing. So the fragility of that kind of system for um, conferring benefits is immediately apparent. Nevertheless, in our wisdom, we've decided to confer benefits on those kind of social structures. And then the argument becomes, well, if you're going to confer benefits on those kind of social structures on the basis that you are reinforcing some form of social stability, why would you stop with heterosexual couples if gay and lesbian couples demonstrate those same characteristics of stability dependence to a greater or lesser extent, familial solidarity, and so on. And there really isn't a good argument, in my opinion, against conferring those benefits. Now, I think with, with those opening remarks, what we have to look at is the legal terrain that you enter into when you wish to, or when you are seeking benefits for gay and lesbian employees. And the legislation which deals with the conferral of employment benefits is brought with several different levels of complexity and contradiction. First off, the essential constitutional division of powers in Canada gives rise to one level. That is why while provincial legislation regulates the systems of conferring the benefits themselves, such as health benefits and pensions, federal legislation regulates the question of taxation of these benefits and the plans which provide them. This fiscal taxation power, as will be seen fr from the review in my paper, which I'll skim through, um, plays not a not incidental role in the formulation of social policy around recognition of gay and lesbian relationships. And, and by way of illustration, let me explain. When employees come to me and ask whether they can get employment benefits for their same-sex partners, we begin a, a, to engage one way or another in a dialogue with their employer, either through uh, letters, correspondence, or through grievance procedures, or through face-to-face -face negotiations. And the answer that comes back most frequently from the employer is, we won't offer those benefits because Revenue Canada has threatened to deregister and therefore take away all the tax benefits to me as an employer. They've threatened to deregister health plans, and pension plans that offer same-sex spousal benefits. And so the tax law then becomes a weapon in the hands of some bureaucrats and perhaps some federal politicians for enforcing a particular social policy without having had any inquiry into the validity of that enforcement. The next level of complexity then that is illustrated is, uh, by that situation is that of the disparate but sometimes converging roles of social policy legislation like the code in the charter and the tax law. And the example I just provided to you illustrates how that occurs. The question then becomes who should have rights, how should they be granted, and who are the authorities to which we will cede responsibility for implementation of social and rights policy? Are we going to have employers administer social policy, provincial legislators, federal legislators, courts, or tax bureaucrats? In making the decision as to whom we will allow to formulate social policy, we may do well to consider who's most accountable. Let me hasten to add that my listing of the possible nominees for this responsibility in no way should be taken of a suggestion of a hierarchy in descending order of accountability. We all know that everyone up in Revenue Canada is immediately accountable to us, the citizens of this country. So with those kinds of juxtapositions and those kind of intersecting um, legislative frameworks, I think we have to go back to basics and we have to start with the Human Rights Code in Ontario. As I said earlier, it begins with a general prohibition against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. 
and uh, that's found at section 5 sub 1. Interestingly enough, it doesn't include a prohibition on discrimination on the base, uh, basis of sexual, er, doesn't include a prohibition on harassment on the basis of sexual orientation, which um, theoretically would be cured by Murphy's Law or Bill 45, which would purport to amend that uh, oversight. However, the code does permit certain forms of discrimination in matters related both to employment and the provision of services at section 252. That section allows discrimination in the provision of superannuation and pension plans and contracts of group insurance that usually provide health care uh, benefits on the basis of age, sex, marital status, or family status. Although this section allows discrimination on those bases under the plans, it does not allow discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. So if a plan purports to only offer family benefits to opposite sex spouses, is it discriminating on the basis of marital status or is it discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation? That's the question that the cases have attempted to deal with and the Leshner decision and the Clinton decision uh, illustrate um, ways in which they have come down on, that, uh, on, on both sides of that argument. You should also be aware that the definition of marital status in the code is defined as the status of being married, single, widowed, divorced, or separated, and includes the status of living with a person of the opposite sex in a conjugal relationship outside of marriage. Thus, the concept of marital status contains within it a form of differentiation or discrimination against conjugal relationships outside of marriage as between partners of the same sex. One argument that was advanced and accepted in the Clinton decision, which was Beth Clinton's challenge to the Ontario Blue Cross plan, is that this definition is itself internally inconsistent with the anti-discrimination provisions of the code dealing with sexual orientation. By extension, as was argued and accepted in the Leshner case, this definition is contrary to the Charter of Rights. Uh, using an analogous grounds argument to find protection against sexual orientation discrimination. So Clinton carried out an exercise of redefining or reconsidering marital status within the four corners of the code, and Leshner uh, resorted to, um, perhaps more successfully some might say, resorted to the charter. Spouse is similarly defined in the code with an opposite sex definition of, uh, of the uh, people living together in the conjugal relationship and it would be susceptible to the same arguments regarding sexual orientation discrimination. Now, the fact that spouse is susceptible to arguments about discrimination became particularly clearly defined in the debates around Bill 167 in the Ontario Legislature. In the course of those debates, and in an effort to move the bill through second reading, <clears throat> the Attorney General spoke to amendments which would be made to the bill should it reach the Standing Committee. Those amendments included the substitution of the term domestic partner instead of a redefinition of the term spouse. The original Bill 167 would have redefined spouse to eliminate a reference to of the opposite sex, and the Attorney General attempted to substitute a new term for gay and lesbian relationships, those of domestic partners. Such an amendment, although going beyond the current judicial analysis, would have established a term for same-sex relationships, which could then be considered as part of the concept of marital status. It's not been litigated yet, and this highlights another way of approaching the problem of establishing rights to benefits, and that is by the introduction of a new term, domestic partners, which may be p more palatable to some decision makers and some employers. It would be another form of status to be considered within the general question of a person's marital status. Of course, it too is susceptible to a charter challenge that it confers separate but perhaps not equal status. Such terminology was also recently introduced in the uh, California State Legislative Initiative to deal with um, the rights of householders who cohabit in domestic relationships. The Employment Standards Act provisions are the next level of provisions that you have to look at when you're considering benefits. Within the exceptions to the general prohibition against discrimination under the code, the Employment Standards Act is invoked. It's invoked by uh, reference uh, in that section that I told you about, Section 25, Sub 2. The provision of the Employment Standards Act, which, which is brought into play, begin with Section 33 under Part 10 of the Act, which basically set out that the part applies to funds and plans and arrangements 
offered by employers to employees. And it indicates at sub 2 of 33 that except as provided in the regulations, no employer or person acting directly on behalf of an employer shall provide, furnish, or offer any fund, plan, arrangement, or benefit that differentiates or makes any distinction, exclusion, or preference between employees or a class or classes of employees or their beneficiaries, survivors, or dependents because of the age, sex, or marital status of the employees. Thus far, it would seem that the general prohibition against discrimination in employment on these grounds is maintained. In other words, there's a consonance between the Human Rights Code and the Employment Standards Act. However, Regulation 321 under the Employment Standards Act permits discrimination in pension plans. It permits it on the basis of marital status. And it, the regulation also permits uh, certain kinds of exemptions for the provision of life insurance. It also permits kinds of discrimination for the provision of short and long-term disability plans and with respect to health insurance plans. So in other words, where the consonance between the code and the Employment Standards Act appears on the face to exist, when you delve deeper and go into the regulation, you find that for certain purposes discrimination can occur. But when you delve even further into why those forms of discrimination are allowed to occur, you will see that it has not so much to do with the social policy about whether or not people conform to certain ideas of family or marital status, but it has more to do with the cost of providing those benefits. In other words, plans are allowed to discriminate on the basis of marital status because sometimes the benefits provided for those who are married or in common law relationships are greater than those provided to single people. The cost is greater, and therefore, the plans and their administrators are allowed to discriminate against married couples by charging them more. That is not a social policy justification for excluding gay or lesbian employees. That's a cost analysis that's built into the regulation. You should also note that um, like the code provisions which allow certain forms of discrimination, the Employment Standards Act provisions um, while allowing certain forms of discrimination based on marital status and age do not allow discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Indeed, under Regulation 321, there would appear to be a broader definition power with respect to both marital status and spouse for employment benefits. In Section 1 of that regulation, marital status is defined as follows. The condition of being an unmarried person who is supporting in whole or in part a dependent child or children and includes a common law status of husband and wife as defined in the pension, life insurance, disability insurance, or benefit, or health insurance, or benefit plan, fund, or arrangement provided, furnished, or offered by an employer to an employee. The regulation allows the plans to define their own terminology. The regulation allows plans to extend benefits to gay and lesbian couples. That would seem to be the end of the problem. Spouse is also similarly a wide open term under that regulation. Under that regulation, the plans are permitted to define spouse as they see fit. Neither of these terms, spouse or marital status, are restricted or confined by some other definition in some other part of the act. And so we get to the point where it appears that it's okay to offer gay and lesbian employees and their partners family benefits. But then we have the Pension Benefits Act. The Pension Benefits Act provisions and the Pension Commission of Ontario's interpretation of them represent one of the significant barriers to ending discrimination against gay and lesbian employees and their partners in Ontario. The Pension Benefits Act uses an opposite sex definition of spouse and it uh, makes reference to the Family Law Act and, and I won't go into a lot of detail about that but suffice it to say that the opposite sex definition of spouse is carried through the Pension Benefits Act. Pension Benefits Act, as we all know from the recent uh, media barrage on these issues, provides for survivor pensions to spouses, to opposite sex spouses of members or employees. Now, despite the Leshner decision, which found that the conferral of benefits using an opposite sex definition of spouse violated the code and the charter, and despite its general interpretation of those 
words. The Pension Commission of Ontario issued a bulletin in 1992 stating the following. It is important to note that the ruling of the Human Rights Commission, they got that part wrong already, it wasn't, it was the Board of Inquiry, applies only to the public service pension plan, that's the government pension plan, and extends same-sex survivor benefits to an individual living in a conjugal relationship with a member in an arrangement outside the plan. They missed half the decision. The decision also went on to say, aside from the fact that the government had to set up an offside pension plan to provide Mr. Leshner and his spouse with benefits, the decision went on to say, and the government is directed to take whatever court action is necessary in order to challenge the income tax rules that prohibit the existing pension plan from offering uh, same-sex benefits, but never mind. The Pension Commission of Ontario went on to say, there's no requirement for plans, including the public service pension plan, to be amended to provide same-sex benefits. Plans providing same-sex survivor benefits will not be accepted for registration by the Pension Commission of Ontario, nor will amendments be accepted in that regard. So it didn't really matter that the general analysis in Leshner found that the restriction to opposite-sex opposite spouses was discriminatory. It didn't really matter that it represented a significant anti-discrimination initiative in Ontario. It didn't really matter that one could, naively perhaps, expect the Pension Commission to be a little concerned about this and perhaps seek its own qu uh, answer to a constitutional question in court so that it would know how to administer its own ultimately challengeable piece of legislation. Instead, what it did was take a Stonewall, pardon the pun for those who understand that this is the 25th anniversary of Stonewall, it took a Stonewall position on this and said, we won't even accept them for registration. With this pronouncement, the Commission launched itself into the murky field of regulating social policy as opposed to regulating fiscally responsible administration of pension plans. One interpretation of its pronouncement would be that since the Act itself defines spouse, no d expanded definition of spouse is ever possible. Yet if the Leshner decision stands not only for a specific application of the law, but also a general interpretation of the law on which the specific is based, then there seems to be little territory for a continued defense of an exclusionary and discriminatory provision of the Act. Nevertheless, the Pension Commission says, no way, no how, you can't have these kind of plans. So if you have an employee walk into your office trying to um, establish that they have a right to a survivor pension, you should be aware that they should probably be challenging the Pension Commission of Ontario, and they should also probably be challenging the Pension Benefits Act itself and that raises another host of litigation strategy questions as to whether one challenges it through human rights litigation or through constitutional questions in court. You should know that there is a charter challenge to the Pension Benefits Act going on right now. Um, it's not the Commission bringing this, but it is uh, being brought by QP National on behalf of an employee, Nancy Rosenberg, who also happens to be their general in-house counsel. Um, it suffered some setbacks in the federal court, who de which declined to deal with the question, but it is uh, to go forward in the provincial su uh, superior courts, Court of Ontario. The balance of the papers in this conference deal extensively with the evolving case law, so I didn't intend to deal with it extensively here, but let me highlight to you three cases that are important. The first is Hague which is an Ontario Court of Appeal decision which determined that the Canadian Human Rights Act was deficient and contrary to the Charter because it did not prevent discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and it read in that protection. The second is the Leshner decision of which you've al I've already mentioned some. Uh, that was a decision in which the majority determined that the code's definition of marital status, not the code's definition of spouse, but the code's definition of marital status violated the Charter. The third is the Clinton decision, which failed at the divisional court level, but at the Board of Inquiry level, uh, engaged in an, in an analysis of the term marital status and the conflict or apparent conflict between it and the prohibition against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. 
the uh, Board of Inquiry found that the marital status definition violated the code's own prohibition against sexual orientation discrimination and therefore um, found that benefits should be extended. The divisional court rejected that and in a decision reminiscent of the Mossop uh, case um, declined to hear charter arguments which were successful in the Leshner case on the basis that the Commission Council had not apparently given sufficient notice to the federal and provincial attorney general of this uh, constitutional question. That decision is being appealed. Those are, the, those are the, the framework, those are the decision framework that is, is offered so far for the analysis of uh, how one challenges benefit plans. You challenge them on the basis of an analysis within the code or you challenge them on the basis of an analysis based on charter arguments that challenge the legislative enactments which prohibit the conferral of those benefits. But the arguments don't stop there and as I've alluded to before, the Income Tax Act has been invoked by the Revenue Canada to prevent any further um, extension of those benefits so that the challenges also must be made at that level. Bill 167 would have redressed some of this pro these problems by amending the provincial legislation, although even it contained within it uh, limitations on that in that they were not going to invoke the changes to the Pension Benefits Act until the federal legislation had been amended. Bill 45, which is theoretically, at least at 3 o'clock, it was still before the Justice Committee. Um, it could be gone by now. Uh, bill 45 is Tim Murphy's private member's bill, which would amend the Human Rights Code. It theoretically could provide a leg up for those arguing these cases in court. Um, basically, the dilemma for those litigating these issues is that even for employment benefits, the litigation has to go on on a variety of fronts for each piece of, uh, for each plan that is challenged. It has to go on at a provincial level with respect to the provincial legislation, and it has to go on at a federal level with respect to the tax legislation. And in that sense, uh, I think a few things, a few principles or a few points can be derived. For those of us who practice employment law, several points are clear. The courts are indicating a preference for the recognition of gay and lesbian relationships in the area of earned benefits. It's more problematic in the area of family law. Employers are slowly paying heed to this development. Legislators are running behind the general public on this issue, as was illustrated in an embryonics poll, which indicated that a majority of the public surveyed uh, would uh, support extension of employment benefits, and there will be lots of litigation. At least for the lawyers, that's good news. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Susan. Uh, we're now going to have our panel discussion, and uh, Judith Keene will introduce the panelists, and um, that should run for about an hour. And this is the part where we encourage you to raise questions, issues, uh, particular topics that you want to discuss, and have more of a, an interaction rather than talking at you type of scenario. <laughs> 